Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. My dad always told me, he said, son, do not be quick to give your word. But if you do give it, you keep it or you die trying to keep it. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. I want to share with you some prescriptions from the doctor. Uh, Some things I learned from Doc, from my dad, uh, growing up, and you know, like, like Paul spoke in the book of Romans, my dad was one of those, even though he didn't get saved until he was in his 50s, the work of the law was written in his heart. And, uh, you know, he was trying to do it right. He wasn't saved. And there was a lot of just good things that I learned from my dad growing up. But before I get into those, just so you don't get the idea he was perfect, uh, he certainly wasn't. Uh, you know, my dad would not throw anything away. Uh, He went through the Great Depression. Um, That affected him as well as twice that I know of. His family lost everything due to floods. Uh, He was raised very poor and one time had to be rescued from the roof of his house with his siblings and my grandparents by someone in a rowboat, but literally lost everything they owned twice in his life. And somehow that affected him very deeply and he just couldn't throw anything away. Uh, Just, no, we'll we'll need that sometime. I mean, even food that should have been thrown away, he would not get rid of it. Um, Dad wasn't big on giving affirmation or praise. Again, just a sort of a product of how he was raised. And so if he did ever affirm you or praise you, you knew it was a big deal because it was so rare. And then dad wasn't big on showing affection either. Um, not to my mom. I don't remember ever growing up or to me or to my sister. Um, again, just a, a product of the environment he was raised in. I will say, though, after he got saved, he got better at some of those things, at showing affection and giving affirmation. He, he sort of grew incrementally in, in those things. When it came to throwing stuff away, he just got worse. <laughs> he was a work in progress like all of us are. But you know, there was some really good things that I did learn from dad, and I want to talk to you about those. And I'm actually just going to use the word father as an acrostic today. So F, that stands for friends. Proverbs 17 and verse 17, a friend loves at all times. If my dad was your friend, he would stick with you. Didn't matter if you were up or down, in or out, good season, bad season. If he was your friend, that was it. He was your friend for life. Proverbs 18, 24 says, Friends come and go, but a true friend sticks by you like family. Most translations just say there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, often in life, my dad told me, says, listen, you will be lucky if you have two or three close friends in your lifetime. You'll have many acquaintances, but very, very few close, true friends. And I've I've actually found that to be fairly accurate. You know, those that are in my inner circle, to me, they're the ones that if I make a fool of myself, they don't believe I've done a permanent job of it. And I can be myself around them. Listen, if you have some true friends, you should be thankful. All right, we come to our next letter, A. Always be learning. Always be developing your gifts. Explore, grow. Proverbs 1 and verse 5 says, A wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. My dad was a perpetual student. He was always learning. He was always increasing. And not just in in the scriptures, but in life. He was always learning something. He was always reading something, always exploring something. You know, he he would explore and, and learn everything he could about Native American religions and culture and actually went on 
to learn key phrases in like a dozen different Native American languages. He spoke a fair bit of French as well. He could carry on a rudimentary conversation with anybody in French. He was a dentist. He loved nature. He studied the etymology of words and phrases. He was a painter. He went forward and, and he pursued different interests. He pursued and developed the different gifts that God had put in him. And the lesson is, don't stop learning. Don't stop growing. Don't stop exploring. Listen, there are treasures in you, but they have to be dug out. Every one of us, you're not just a you know, one-layered person. There's a lot of dimensions to you. God has put a lot in every one of you, in every one of us. And it would be a shame to live and, and die and, and never explore and develop those things that are inside of you. Always be learning. Try something new. I'm telling you, there's stuff in you. And for your own benefit and joy in life, you should develop those things, but also for the benefit of others. Other people need those things God put in you. He didn't put them in there just to lay dormant. He wants you to tap into them and develop them, learn, grow, and expand. All right, our next letter is T. Take time for yourself. Mark 6 and 31, Jesus speaking to the disciples said, and he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. I think my dad spoke to me about this more than any other thing and he modeled it as well. You know, he had a very demanding practice as a dentist and I think probably just because of his way, people felt that they could sort of seek him out at any time, and some people just didn't have boundaries. There were folks, this happened regularly, they'd come to our house. I'd be playing in the front yard, your dad here? Yeah, they'd come up to the front door and knock, hey doc, I got this thing, would you mind looking at my teeth? I mean, literally, people are coming to the house, found out where we live, they're there all the time, and calling the house, I remember getting in trouble, you know, by answering the phone, yeah, he's here, and he's going, and you, you can see smoke coming out of his ears, like, I want to be left alone right now. And so he had this very demanding practice as a dentist. So he would take time off and go hiking, backpacking, camping. I used to go with him as a kid every single weekend. We went into the local mountains and would spend a couple of days there. Later on, we would go into the high Sierra, spend a week, week and a half, and then I went off the rails as a young teenager with drugs and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so dad no longer had me as a partner to backpack and to hike with. And so he'd take other friends with him. And when he couldn't get anybody to go, he'd go by himself. He'd spend a week in the back country, you know, just by himself, fishing and, and, you know, hiking and exploring. But he always told me, you need to have that for yourself. Now, I think it's important, you know, to, to pray and read the scriptures, absolutely. But you're, you're also, you know, you're an emotional being. And you need to find something that fills your emotional tank. With me, I like to golf, and I like to get out on, on the water. I like to fish, or I like to jump in the water and spearfish. It's very physically demanding, but it's really good for my soul. 1 Timothy 6 and 17 says, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. What do you enjoy? What fills that emotional tank of yours? I don't think it's a luxury that you spend time doing that. I think it's a necessity. I do those things because it allows me to give my best self to my wife and my family and to you, you know, as the church, to, to live a balanced life. I work really hard. You know, I pray and I study hard and I try and preach with all of my heart and soul, but I also play really hard. And it's important for me to do that. And I think it's important for you as well. You know, I had the, the privilege years ago to become friends with a preacher named Oral Roberts. And Oral and I would golf quite often together. He actually lived here in Southern California and he would ring me up and say, Bayless, you free? You want to go golf? 
I'd say, yeah, or I'd call him. And we, we'd golf a lot. Sometimes I'd take Harrison with us, but a lot of times it was just me and Oral. And one day we're out on the course, just the two of us playing. And I said, Oral, you know, you've, you've had at that time like 50 years of ministry under his belt. I said, I'm pretty new at this. I said, what, what's the best advice you can give me as a young minister? So I'm waiting. I'm just like, I know he's going to give me some gold. <laughs> and he says, well, Bayless, you got a pretty good golf swing. I suggest you get some lessons. And whatever it costs you, you should join a country club. And then he looked at me and said, golf's the only thing that's kept me alive. And then he went back to hitting a shot. I was so disappointed. I thought, really? That's the best you've got? I sort of tucked it away and just thought, eh, not what I expected. Maybe three months later, maybe even less than that, I'm in Australia. I'm preaching a national conference for a large Pentecostal group there. They found out I liked to golf, so they put me out with an older guy. His name was Leo. He was one of the uh, sort of the founding guys of the movement there in Australia. It was a bit of a legend, you know, among that movement. And so we're, we're golfing, walking the golf course, and Leo begins to tell me a story. He says, you know, Bayless, in the early days of the movement, we were Pentecostal holiness, which basically meant we were very legalistic. Boys weren't allowed to wear shorts, no matter how hot it got. There was never mixed bathing. You know, boys and girls couldn't go in the same swimming pool at the same time. Um, women weren't allowed to cut their hair. Uh, boys were not allowed to play sports. We, it was, we were told it was a sin for us, you know, to play any kind of sport, so we had to abstain. Said, and he said, as a young preacher, I developed some pretty serious physical symptoms. And I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, Leo, you know, after examining him, there's nothing wrong with you per se, but your health is breaking down, and I'll tell you why. He said, what, what's your release valve? He said, well, what do you mean? He says, what do you do as a hobby? He said, I read the Bible. He said, that's good that you read the Bible, but you need a hobby. He said, no, I read the Bible and I pray. He said, we'll keep doing that, but I'm just telling you, all the stress from life and ministry, you're carrying it with you, and if you don't do something as a relief valve, you know, as a release valve, find some sort of a hobby, you will go to an early grave because this is all stress-related. So Leo looked at me and said, Bayless, what I did next was absolutely scandalous. I took up the game of golf. <laughs> he said there was such gossip and such backlash in the denomination. He says I got so much flack for it, but he said I wasn't going to go to an early grave. And then he turns around. We're in the middle of a fairway. He looks at me and says, Bayless, golf is the only thing that's kept me alive. I thought, I just heard the same thing recently. <laughs> and then I thought back to when I was in Bible college. They brought in a missionary from Borneo. To me, that was the uttermost parts of the earth. And so I'm sitting on the edge of my seat thinking, okay, you know, talk to me about souls. Talk to me about sacrifice. And he starts off saying, listen, I've been on the mission field a long time, and I just want to tell you, if you're going to make it as a missionary, you have to have a hobby. He said, mine is beachcombing. I collect shells. And I, I remember thinking, can we please get a real missionary? <laughs> and I almost just, just turned him off. But then I, after I'd heard Oral and then Leo, I sort of connected the dots. And I don't look at that, that time that, that, that I take as a luxury. I look at it as a necessity. And by the way, I make sure my wife gets her time as well with her girlfriends and being able to do the things that she loves to do. And I have time with her as well. So it's not, it's certainly not just about me, but I want to be able to give my best, but I want my wife to be at her best as well. So I make sure that as well as myself, she gets that time. So it is take time for yourself. We come to the next letters, H, honesty and integrity. My dad always told me, he said, son, do not be quick to give your word, but if you do give it, you keep it, or you die trying to keep it. I never knew my father once to break a promise. I never knew him to break his word to any human being 
ever. Psalm 15 and verse 1 asks some questions. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Part of the answer is given in verse 4. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. You know, keeping your word is central to having a good name. Proverbs 22 and 1 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. I bought my, my daughter an old used Jeep years and years ago and uh, needed to have some work done on it. And so I talked to a friend. I said, do you have a, a mechanic you can recommend? He says, well, yeah, Bayless, there's this guy. Um, he'll even come out to your house. He's, real, he's honest and, and he's you know, fairly priced. I said, okay. So I called the guy. He comes to the house. So the Jeep's in the driveway, pops the hood, and he looks at it and says, okay, here's your problem. He says, I can go to the parts store, be back in 15 minutes, I can get the part, you pay for that, and it'll be $80 for me to do it. It'll take me about 30 minutes to fix it. I said, okay. So he runs off to the parts store, comes back. But the further he gets into fixing it, he realizes there's more to be done. So he knocks on my front door, says, look, um, I've gotten into it. This is a bigger job than I thought. I'm going to need another part. And uh, would you mind going to the auto parts store for me? So he tells me what it is. I write it down. I go, and it was, I don't know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, whatever. I come back with the part, and he spends three or three and a half hours now getting the, the, the car running right. So he gets done, and I say, okay, what do I owe you? He says, $80. I said, well, yeah, but you told me that when you thought it was, you know, not going to be so involved, and you didn't spend a half hour. You spent more than three hours here. So what do I owe you? And he got mad at me. He said, listen, I know that I spent more time here, but I gave you my word. I said, $80. It'll be $80, and don't ask me again. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Paid him his 80 bucks. I will tell you, I gave him probably 50 times over that in business from recommendations that I gave to him. I just, everybody that, everyone that ever asked me about a mechanic, now this was years and years ago. I don't even know if he's still alive. He was kind of old then. But uh, heck, you know, he, his word was important to him, and it made me want to do business with him and tell other people as well. If you give your word, don't be quick to give it. But if you give it, keep it or die trying. All right, next letter is E. It's ever ready with a joke. If you knew my dad, you knew he had a sense of humor. Didn't matter what the situation was, he had a joke to fit every circumstance in every situation. Never did I ever find him without a joke, and they usually involve elaborate storytelling. I have no idea where he learned all these jokes. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Keeping one's faith in times of distress often requires a sense of humor. Martin Luther said, if God didn't have a sense of humor, I wouldn't want to go to heaven. You know, I actually heard this a couple of times, overheard people saying, who's that old guy sitting out in the foyer telling off-color jokes? He's really naughty. And somebody said, that's pastor's dad. <laughs> it's true. I was at LAX one day. I got stuck in an elevator with like seven or eight other people. Got stuck between floors, and we got on the little phone in there, and it was dead. And we're waiting, and it was interesting. I, I observed everyone in the elevator. Everyone responded differently. A couple people out and out panicked. Started talking about being claustrophobic and literally panic. A couple people got extremely angry. You know, I've got a blank and blank, you know, flight to catch, and... Don't they just keep their stupid elevator in working order? Other people just this look of astonishment. Like, is this really happening to me? Other people not knowing what to do. You know what I did? I started cracking jokes. <laughs> no one found them funny but me. 
And finally, me and another guy got in, sort of did this Klingon thing, and we opened up the <laughs> elevator doors, and we're literally stuck between floors, like here. We lifted everybody out of the elevator, including a woman in her wheelchair. We lifted them out, and then we had to crawl out on our bellies to get out. And after that happened, I remember thinking, I'm becoming my father. <laughs> I actually cracked jokes with a bunch of strangers in an elevator. But that's exactly what my dad would have done. Now, becoming like my dad in that respect, I actually don't mind. It's not a bad thing. All right, our final letter, R, stands for reciprocity. More specifically, the law of reciprocity. That when you do something good, there's a reciprocal action that takes place. My dad would put it this way. You do good, good things for other people, said it will come back to you. It'll always come back. I remember one time in particular, I was like 16, was at the bank and I think I withdrew 30 bucks from my account. And uh, when I got outside, I realized there was two $10 bills stuck together. The teller had actually given me $40. I thought it was 30, she thought it was 30, but there was two, two bills stuck together and it's like, whoa, 40 bucks. That was a lot of money when I was a 16 year old. I won't tell you what I would have bought with it, but it was a lot of money back then. <laughs> Could buy quite a bit of illegal stuff with $40. But I thought about what my dad had said. I went back into the bank, Big line had formed, so I got at the end of the line, waited and waited and waited, and then I had to wait for that teller to open up, and I finally got up there about 20 minutes later. I said, hey, you know, I just took out 30 bucks. I said, there was two $10 bills stuck. You gave me 40. She was so thankful. She said, I would have had to taken that out of my, my wallet at the end of the day if, you know, my transactions didn't balance. She said, thank you. And I casually, somehow the next day or so, brought that up in a conversation with my dad, and he just reiterated, it's his good son. It's one of the few times he really laid on some praise. He said, good. He said, that will come back to you. Do you know the scriptures teach that? In Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse seven, it says, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. But here's the God factor. It'll be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God will cause men to give into your bosom or to pour it into your lap. It will come back if you'll do a good turn for someone else. I'm telling you, there is a divine law that God has instituted. And if you will do good when it's not convenient for you, when you have no promise from that person or no way for that person to pay you back, God will see that it does come back to you eventually. And when it comes back, it comes back multiplied. You know, at the end of dad's life, he was not mobile any longer. And I would uh, go over and shave him and clip his toenails and wash his hair and just different stuff. And I was there one day, I think I'd been shaving him, and he's laying in the bed, and he's got this far-off look on his face. I said, Dad, what are you thinking about? He said, eternity. I said, well, what about it? He said, it's forever and ever and ever and forever and ever and ever and ever. And he just kept saying that over and over. He said, it's forever. My friend, we were made for eternity. The scripture says God has put eternity in our hearts. This earthly life, it's, it's fleeting. 70, 80, 90 years, it's here and it's gone. And then we step into eternity. Really, this life is just a dressing room for eternity. And we need to make our peace with God while we have the opportunity here because this life, it's over quick. You know, I was talking about things that my dad taught me and the truth is, I miss him all the time. 
I think a lot about my dad. I actually had a meal with some old friends last night and, and one of them brought up my dad's sense of humor and, and uh, I had a bit of a rough moment. But the good news is I will get to see my dad again. He was a believer in Jesus Christ and I know where he is. Now he's not gonna come to me, but if Jesus tarries, I am gonna go to him. I have the assurance that I'm gonna be with my father, my heavenly father, but my earthly father again in heaven. I'm gonna be reunited with him. And all of those that have put their trust in Christ, we have the hope of seeing loved ones again. My friend, this life is just a dressing room for eternity. It's here for a moment and then it is gone. And if you've not put your trust in Christ, I urge you, do so today, do it right now. You'll never regret that decision. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. Make room in your daily schedule for God's Word by signing up for Bayless's devotionals, available on your phone, tablet, or PC. Take time to sow the seeds of God's Word into your life every day with this free email devotional. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have the setting circumstances, the storms of life come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special gift that we want to get into your hands called There Is Always Hope. It's a bundle of, of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you hope. I hope that you get it. God wants to get your hopes up, way up, or maybe the hopes of a loved one. Along with two hope-inspiring CD messages, this bundle includes a booklet with Bayless amazing story of how God completely turned his life around, setting him free from years of addiction and confusion. Call or order online now. Just use the information on your screen and be encouraged. There is always hope.